Well, welcome to the Southwest Collection at Texas Tech University. My name is uh, Monty Monroe. I'm the archivist of the Southwest Collection, and it's my uh, great privilege to introduce our uh, uh, beginning speaker here, and that is the Chancellor of the Texas Tech University System, uh, uh, Robert Duncan. And of course, as many of you know, uh, uh, the Chancellor was uh, formerly a senator uh, from the state of Texas and is very familiar with the Chandler family, and so he's going to give us a few remarks here today. Chancellor, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Monty. It's a great honor to be here in the Formby Room uh, for a big day. Uh, when I saw this uh, coming up and the opportunity for Texas Tech to have these papers and uh, this archive, it was really exciting uh, for me. Um, you know, Coke Stevenson was affectionately known as Mr. Texas. He embodied the hard work and integrity we strive to make a, a synonymous with our state. I'm not a historian, but I've read a lot of books. I love the Caro books on LBJ, and I think Caro really does uh, uh, capture Coke Stevenson as well as anybody and the integrity that he described. And I think I think he indicated that uh, Coke Stevenson was probably one of the had the, some of the highest integrity of any any uh, uh, po politician or policymaker in the state of Texas, and so uh, we're really excited that this particular collection is going to be here at Texas Tech University. Uh, the collection supplements the holdings of other political officials uh, held here at the Southwest Collection, including Governor Preston Smith, uh, William Bledsoe, who actually wrote the bill that created Texas Tech University. Uh, the uh, former speaker in Texas, Attorney General Wagner Carr. We've done pretty well out here in West Texas, haven't we? Uh, as well as uh, uh, Texas House Speaker Pete Laney. I know also Marshall Formby's works are here. He was a former state senator and my uncle. And so uh, it's a pretty cool deal to be here in the Formby room to be doing this. Uh, the papers of former Tech President and U.S. Secretary of Education, Laurel Cavazos and the records of every congressman from the 19th Congressional District, from George Mahon to Randy Nagelbauer. So uh, this is a unique opportunity for us and a very exciting one for me. It's also exciting because Freddie Chandler was my fraternity brother and in fact bailed me out in Aggie Co. a couple of times whenever I had uh, a few issues uh, with Dr. Lee one time I remember uh, very much. Uh, and uh, was Freddie's uh, the uh, uh, son-in-law of, um, of uh, of Coke Stevenson and uh, uh, his grandson, um, Texas, Tech, Te Texas State Representative Andrew Murray is my fellow Texas Tech Law School grad and was a county judge whenever I was, uh, he was my constituent and I got to know him real well and I'm very proud of what uh, he does. Uh, I'd also like to recognize his daughter Jane Chandler uh, who so graciously initiated the process, this process of gifting this important collection to the Southwest Collection uh, back in 2013. Jane, thanks so much for preser preserving these records. Uh, this is important and, uh, and it's very important that uh, we're, we have them here because I think Coke Stevenson was one of us. And uh, I think he, uh, in my view, I see his picture when I served in the Senate, his picture is right there when you come out of the Ramsey room, we call it the torture chamber. That's where they make you vote for things you don't want to vote for. And um, But his picture hangs up there and I would always see that picture and I would think of the integrity that he brought uh, to the Texas legislative process, to the Texas House and the Texas Senate. And uh, I often used, whenever we were doing the voter ID bill in Texas legislature, uh, I was a chair, I got the chair of the Committee of the Whole, a 24-hour hearing, and uh, one of the debates was always, well, you just don't, we, nobody can prove that there's fraud. And I always said, well, go ask Coke Stevenson about that in Box 13. That was a pretty uh, a, a significant uh, part of our history uh, that I thought was uh, very interesting, and perhaps Coke Stevenson should have been our U.S. Senator. So anyway, it's with great pride here at Texas Tech University that we welcome these documents, these papers, these archives, uh, and it's a great honor uh, for us to have those, have one of our own, uh, West Texas, Coach Stevenson, uh, here at Texas Tech University Southwest Collection. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Andy Murr, and uh, Monty finagled me into making sure that I had remarks also, but I'll keep them very brief because I don't think that I could uh, say anything further than what the Chancellor's already added. Uh, I would make a couple of points. One, we're here because of politics, but more importantly, I think we have the opportunity to learn about a person who we can look back fondly and say, this person is an example that we can hold up as what a statesman might be like. And in the day of 24-hour politics and watching news cycles come and go with what you might call the most sensational topic of the day for your headline, uh, it's, it's kind of an overwhelming feeling to think that is politics all about uh, hatred or anger or whose side can get in the best blow but actually not necessarily worry about legislating at the end of the day because there are things like roads and schools and and the world around us still has to go around and people have jobs to do and so when you can look back on history and find an example that you can hold up perhaps then we can turn around and and push that our children our next generation can attain that standard once again uh, part of my job is to identify some of the important family members that have come today for this occasion. And uh, I, 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 what we can do is hold our applause till the end, but I'd like everybody to at least stand up, and I'm going to do it by family groups. And so uh, I'm going to end with my mother because she's going, we've also finagled her into speaking. And so uh, with that, I'm going to start with my cousins. And so with us today, we have Robin Jaton and her husband, Sam. If you'll just stand up, we can hold our applause till the end. We also have Kelly Kirk and husband Kyle and their four children, Cole, Corey, Kyler, and Case. And then we also have Marshall Heap and his son, Andrew Heap, who is currently a student at the Texas Tech University School of Law. And then we have my sister, Rachel Bean, and her husband, Ryan, and their children, Claire and Wyatt. And so what I'd like to do, if you could... Please thank them for coming all this way. Thank you. Each of us has our own personal memories that uh, are attached to our family and how, how our roles play with all of this and who it makes us who we are. Mike, I didn't overlook you. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I also have a very important person here, and that would be my stepfather. Fred Chandler, and I just want to thank him. He is there to provide support and, a, and an anchor of reason and logic to my mother when in times when she worries about things. So uh, I also have a friend of mine, a special friend here, Amanda Miller, who's joined us, and she's here too, and I've embarrassed her. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is ask my mother, Jane Chandler, to come up and say a few words she has a unique perspective of growing up in a household with the legacy of Coke Stevenson being a parent, being someone that is a lot closer to you than to the public. And, and I think it's a really unique story. Outside, uh, there is a video recording of, of, of some back and forth, but maybe not all the stories yet. Maybe there'll be more to come. And so I would encourage those that are interested to at least take the time uh, to, to study those a little bit. And what you'll find is there's a humanizing quality that we look back in history and oftentimes we forget because um, basic facts can, can glaze over that. But without further ado, my mother, Jane Chandler. Thank you, Andy. I'm really happy y'all are all here today to honor my father and his amazing career. Others will tell you about his political life. I want to tell you some interesting things about the man that I knew his daddy. He was actually born in a log cabin. He had only 22 months of formal schooling, a fourth grade education. His father was his only formal teacher. He was the oldest of eight children. Money was a little tight. The family was not destitute, but he went to work when he was 10 years old to help support the family riding fence on a large ranch. His salary was one dollar a week. <laughs> his father was a school teacher and the family's home base was London, Texas in those days. When he was about seven, the famous gunslinger John Wesley Harden spent several months in London. 
Daddy remembered seeing him many times. As a young boy, he even attended Hardin's wedding in London to a local girl. As a young man, he became friends with Frank Hamer. Hamer, of course, was a legendary Texas Ranger. Law enforcement, not baseball. <laughs> who, got, who killed the outlaws Bonnie and Clyde. After Daddy became county attorney in 1914, Daddy hired Hamer to help hunt criminals in Kimball County and actually rode with him out looking for thieves and livestock rustlers. He called on him for help after the 1948 election dispute because the authorities in Jim Wells County refused to let the Stevenson aides examine the election results. That scene in which those two old, tough West Texas men went to Jim Wells County and walked down the street confronted by armed men, they say that Hamer told them to get and Daddy just stared them down and walked right past. You couldn't make that up for a movie. Do you know what his driver's license number was? Y'all know? You do? It was number one. He wrote the driver's license bill and he was issued the very first driver's license ever issued in the state of Texas. Ironically, he was a terrible driver. <laughs> he did not even ride in an automobile until he was 18 years old. His ranch vehicle when I was growing up was a four-door Ford sedan. He would push in the clutch and the brake and let it slide to the bottom of a canyon just like a wagon. He loved poetry. He memorized vast amounts of it and he could recite it at the drop of a hat. On the Ides of March, he said, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. On the 18th of April, I heard the entire midnight ride of Paul Revere. His greatest hero, I think, was Abraham Lincoln. And when I was thinking about what to say about Daddy, I remembered how many times he had quoted Lincoln to me. And there are three things that really stand out. I think they had special meaning to Daddy. He said, whatever you are, be a good one. And I think that pretty much sums up his lifelong philosophy. Whether he was janitor or governor, digging a post hole or defending an accused criminal, he always tried to do the best job he could. Another Lincoln saying that he quoted is, I've found most folks can overcome some adversity in their lives, but if you want the true test of a man's character, give him power and watch what he does with it. And I think he took great pride that he had wrestled with the temptations of power and come home to Kimball County to remain an honorable, humble man. The third thing from Lincoln I remember him telling me is I found that most folks are just about as happy as they make up their minds to be. After his loss in the 1948 election, far from retiring in bitterness or indulging in self-pity, or he made a choice to come back to Kimball County and live a quiet, simple life, ranching and practicing law. He fell in love with a ranch on the South Lano River and bought the first part of it with the proceeds from his first legal fee. He built a large house there that is almost entirely out of rock and concrete. Inner walls, ceiling, floors. Some of the floor tiles and fixtures in the house are salvaged from the renovation of the state capitol from 1936. I was born in that house at Telegraph on my parents' second wedding anniversary. My father was almost 68 years old, my mother nearly 38. It was the second marriage for both of them. My father's first wife, Faye, died of cancer in the governor's mansion a few months after he became governor. My mother was also widowed. Her first husband, Gordon Marshall Heap, was an Air Force pilot, shot down and killed in action in World War II. Each had a son. My brother, Coke Jr., was 42 years old when I was born. Dennis was 11. My mother, Marguerite, was petite, barely five feet tall. She was nicknamed Teeny because of her small size, but she was fierce. They're all naughty. <laughs> fiercely intelligent, opinionated, and above all, fiercely devoted to daddy. She was serving as the Kimball County Clerk, the first woman to do so when she and daddy married, and she actually issued their marriage license herself. Mother was a local girl born and raised in Kimball County. Her family had deep Texas roots. 
She was a proud member of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, counting at least 14 ancestors living in Texas in 1836. After Daddy's death, she served on the committee governing the Alamo for about 20 years. I grew up there on the ranch. If you're imagining the glamorous life of the governor's daughter, you might be shocked. The house had no heat, except some portable plug-in electric heaters in a fireplace. No cooling except portable electric fans. There was no washer, no dryer, no TV, no telephone. We did get a phone when I was 13. It was one of 12 on a party line. <laughs> the house had large screen porches and daddy slept outside almost all the time, rain or shine, winter or summer, and I did for too for many years. The house was across a low water crossing and we were often water bound when the river flooded. We had no household help. My parents clean cooked, did yard work themselves. Daddy always got up early, 4 a.m. or so. He liked to have coffee and read a while and then fix breakfast. His favorite food was steak and he liked it broiled over an open flame. In the summer, he cooked it at the river. In the winter, he cooked over the fireplace in the living room. Daddy usually spent mornings at his law office and mother was his secretary. He came back to the ranch in the afternoon and did ranch work. He didn't like being called a politician. If you ask him what he was, he said he was a lawyer. He considered himself a lawyer and he practiced until his death at age 87. He wrote his fees on a blackboard. He did disapproved of that newfangled notion of billing by the hour. He liked to answer the phone himself at his office because he thought mother was a little too abrupt. <laughs> We traveled a lot. Not only did it seem like Daddy had court cases or speeches all over Texas, but in furtherance of my education, Mother and Daddy took me to all 48 of the lower states, actually the state capitals of each of those states, over about a six-year period. Mother drove every mile, and Daddy talked about place names in American history and such. Daddy died in 1975, Mother in 2010. Daddy's official papers, of course, were in the state archives in Austin, but there were a lot of papers and photographs left behind in both the house and his law office injunction, and I struggled to decide what to do with them. It didn't seem right to destroy anything, but I knew they were not in a good place with mice and silverfish and weather. Although some boxes had burned in a fire in the 1960s, there was a lot of stuff left. Mother had not made a lot of progress in her efforts to organize the files. I tell this story. One of the file cabinets I opened had a folder marked important papers. And when you looked in it, there was a 1930-something letter from Governor Allred, a 1969 letter on a lawsuit that Daddy was attorney for, and her lawnmower warranty. <laughs> So we were delighted to be put in touch with the Southwest Collection here at Texas Tech. We toured these impressive facilities and met the personnel, and we agreed that this is the right place to preserve Daddy's collection of papers. All the folks here have been wonderful to work with, and our family considers them friends. Our entire family is deeply appreciative of their help in this process. I hope that these papers give those interested in Daddy a greater understanding of his character, because it was truly unique. Now I'd like to introduce our dear friend, our Southwest Collection Archivist, Dr. Monty Monroe, and he will talk a little bit more about Daddy's political career and business life. Thank you all. I'm not sure how you follow uh, all of these three people, but I'll do my best as a historian. I actually gave an extended version of this on the banks of the Llano, right below the ranch house uh, during the summer to the Texas Historical Foundation. And it was a, an hour long presentation and I was standing there and, and the falls were right behind me. And it, what was it, 100 degrees? Jane, it was, it was pretty hot, but uh, everybody enjoyed it. And I, it was a mystical experience. Jane talks about the house. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place, and you should all go there sometime. And I see Professor John White back here in the back. Uh, he and Elizabeth Loudon. Elizabeth, I don't know if you're here, but uh, they actually went down and they've documented 
uh, that facility as well as uh, some important structures on that property. Uh, one, possibly even a cabin used by Jim Bowie. So it's a wonderful place and hopefully one day it'll be available for some people to, uh, to go and visit and enjoy. Coach Stevenson, as has been said, was born on March the 20th, 1988 at his Hurley grandparents' home, which was situated in Northeast Mason County, Texas. Early in life, he learned the discipline of hard work, respect for elders, and religious faith. As a youngster, Coke worked as a cowhand, built windmills and water tanks, drove a mail hack, and owned a freight line at 16. Think about that. He drove back and forth between Kimball County and, and um, Mason, Tex or Brady, Texas, wasn't it? And while on those trips at night, and this, this was a wagon with a team, okay? Anyway, on those trips, he would sleep under the stars, sometimes in the rain underneath his wagon, and he would read government and bookkeeping and history books contemplating his future. Soon, he took a bank job. He quickly rose from janitor to clerk to bank president. Soon, and about that same time, he decided that he wanted to enter the law. And so Coke apprenticed in the law with a, a distinguished state judge. He passed the bar exam and he established a practice that lasted over 60 years. He became recognized as one of the top attorneys in the state of Texas. Coke was also a success, successful entrepreneur. He dabbled in a number of businesses, including the first Ford Motor Company dealership in Junction, the Junction Eagle newspaper, which still exists, uh, the Hotel Las Lomas, which is a, was an icon at that time, and uh, as well as local electrical, ginning, irrigation, title, and loan businesses. The man was truly a Renaissance man. He was active in the Chamber of Commerce, the Masons, and Rotary. Remarkably, Stevenson built all of these accomplishments, as Jane said, on just 22 months of formal education. Think about that as we sit in this great institution of higher learning. Soon, Stevenson entered politics. He served two terms as Cam Kimball County judge and attorney. Before long, he was elected to Texas House, where he served five terms and became the first speaker of the Texas House to serve consecutive back-to-back -back terms. Believe it or not, in the ranch house is the chair that was given to him by the house, and it may very well be the original chair used by every speaker from the Republic era. That's how important Coach Stevenson was to his colleagues at that time. Anyway, in 1938, he was elected lieutenant governor after his service in the House and was reelected in 1940. He became governor in August 1941 when W. Lee Papi O'Daniel resigned to fill the U.S. Senate seat vacated by the deceased Morris Shepard. Stevenson served two terms uh, as governor of Texas during World War II. Think about it. Texas had over 750,000 service personnel in service during the war. The most highly decorated American Army veteran was from Texas. The most highly decorated Navy veteran was from Texas. Our petrochemical industry was the most important aspect of a lot of the war machinery. And so Coach Stevenson had to oversee all of that. Not only that, he supported the war effort very strongly on behalf of President Roosevelt. He even inspired the Good Neighbor Commission, which many of us have heard about, and he worked very closely with officials in Mexico. Affectionately known as Mr. Texas, after the war, as you've heard, he ran for O'Daniel's vacated U.S. Senate seat. Uh, it, it, Happy O'Daniel found the Senate boring and so he wanted out. And so when that uh, seat opened up, uh, uh, there was a, a runoff for, or a race for it. And Coke won the early election, but there were so many people running, he got the most number of votes that there was a runoff. And in that runoff, as the chancellor has mentioned, 
George Parr, the famous Duke of Duval County, allegedly, allegedly, had voting box number 13 stuffed with 202 ballots that tilted the election to Johnson. And right out here in this exhibit down the hallway, you will see the famous Smithwick letter written by the gentleman from prison who stuffed that ballot box, apologizing to Governor Stevenson. So we're very, that's, that's an important little piece of Texas history that now is here at this institution. Imagine, historians don't do what if history much, but imagine what, what history might have been if Coach Stevenson had gone into uh, the U.S. Senate. Following the controversial Senate election, Stevenson returned home to his Kimball County law practice, friends, and his ranch, as Jane said. Prominent Johnson biographer did say, I was convinced, and I am convinced, that Coach Stevenson was a public official of extraordinary personal integrity, as the Chancellor said. He died at 87 years of age in June 28, 1975. There is no doubt that former Governor Coke R. Stevenson's legacy was secure among the Texans of his generation. He was highly trusted by his political colleagues that he served with, as well as the people who knew him best. Certainly, the reputation of the man that they call Mr. Texas will last well beyond all of us that sit in this room today. And these records that have been gifted to Texas Tech University will ensure that legacy. Now, as Jane mentioned, between 2013 and 2015, the governor's family generously donated the Governor Coates and Marguerite King Heap Stevenson collection to the Southwest Collection. And before I step away from this platform, I want to thank Jane and all of the Stevenson family here uh, and the Heap family for this great legacy. Uh, we can't thank you good folks enough. We, we, we've established a wonderful working relationship with you, and it'll, it'll last for many years. So help us continue to preserve his legacy and, to, and for entrusting that legacy to us for this outstanding West Texas attorney and state leader. You notice I didn't say politician. Thank you. Now, I would like to... Uh, invite the Dean of the Libraries, Dr. Bella Gerlich, to come forward and uh, have some concluding remarks for us. Dean Gerlich. Thank you, Monty. So, uh, in closing, uh, Jane, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Libraries, um, as has already been said by Chancellor Duncan and other folks here, for gifting these important papers to our collection. As a designated regional repository of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, the Southwest Collection will be maintain these wonderful records in perpetuity. This really will be a gem in our collection of political papers. The Southwest Collection is one of the top academic archival institutions in the United States. And it's the generosity of families like yours that has made such a reputation possible. Please know that the Governor Cope and Marguerite King Heap Stevenson papers will teach students, the public, and scholars alike for many generations to come. This collection will serve as a lasting testament to your father's contributions to Texas and the nation, especially during the darkest hours of the Great Depression during World War II. Thank you to all of our dignitaries, guests, and staff for attending today. And special thanks to the folks who made this possible. Dr. Tom R. Sufi of the Junction Campus, and Dr. Jim Brink, former Senior Vice Provost and former Director of the Southwest Collection for connecting our staff with the Stevenson family. We thank you. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Lynn Stoll, our exhibit preparatory who did such a great job, as well as Ryan Burns, the videographer and photographer who produced a great video of Jane. Finally, thanks to all the staff and students who have collected and processed the collection to make it accessible for public research purposes, including John Perrin, Weaver, 
Associate Dean for Special Collections, Dr. Jenny Spurrier, and finally, Southwest Collection Archivist, Dr. Monty Monroe, who have worked closely with the Stevens and family to make this day possible. We now invite everyone to enjoy refreshments, visit, and walk down to the gallery to the east entrance and view the exhibit. Be sure to watch the short video that features Jane, who introduces the exhibit and tells about growing up with the governor. I'm sure there'll be some uh, more stories that were just as wonderful as the one she told tonight. We hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's program and hope to see you again at future events. Jane, family, again, thank you.